Welcome back to Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, where life, sports, and medicine intersect. We're very glad that you continue to support this podcast. You can get the information on any platform uh, where podcasts are played, as well as getting the video content on YouTube. But if you want to just get one place to find all the content, go to my website at drgarrickthesportsdoctor.com and you will find everything on that website. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. If a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands the danger of being exterminated. These were words taken from Carter G. Woodson in 1926 with the birth of the Negro History Week, which is now uh, turned into Black History Month. So happy Black History Month to you all. As you know, February has been deemed Black History Month. And let's just do a brief history of the origin of Black History Month. So as I mentioned, Carter G. Woodson was one of the founding philosophers behind the, the thought of Black history. And it started off initially as a week celebration in 1926. Um, at the time of the Negro History Week's launch, Woodson contended that the teaching of Black history was essential to ensure the physical and the intellectual survival of Blacks within uh, the broader society. Of course, in the beginning, it was scrutinized by many and accepted by few. However, it has continued to gain popularity over the years. Um, the first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State University um, on January 2nd to February the 28th of 1970. So at that point, um, we went from having a week celebration to a, a month celebration. So some might ask, you know, why is Black history isolated to a month? Well, Black history isn't really isolated to a month. However, this has been a designated time to pay respect for the many achievements that African Americans have made in the United States and to honor and give respect and recognition, which is something that has been for many years downplayed um, and for many years, the respect given to many creators and many achievers and people who have started new institutions as well as created many new techniques from surgery to many inventions have been ignored and underrepresented. Uh, so this is a time that from an academic standpoint, when schools will study about Black achievement. However, we know that a truly American history is Black history and that they're interwoven. However, there is much progress to still be made. In 1976, President Gerald Ford uh, recognized Black History Month uh, during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial. He urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And we still are Black history. Uh, we still are, last year I did a, a episode or a series called Black History in the Making. Um, and there's many times, even now, where we are still achieving the first. I belong to a, a group of orthopedic surgeons, African-American orthopedic surgeons. And one day there was someone who got recognized for being the first. And several people chimed in and said they were the first doing other things. Now, let me also remind you that African-Americans make up less than 2% of practicing orthopedic surgeons, somewhere between 1.6 to 1.9%. And as I stood there and thought, I remembered, or I started to think, am I a first? Yes, I'm the first person of color, African-American descent, uh, to practice at my current hospital. And then I started to look a little bit more and probably the first person to ever practice in Jones County, Mississippi. So we are still achieving many firsts even today. Um, you know, this is Super Bowl week. This is the first time to have two African-American quarterbacks play in a league that is dominated by African-Americans. Um, you know, we still are making many milestones, still making new achievements. Um, so Black history is still being made. So I don't want that to be uh, forgotten and I don't want that to be overlooked. But during the month of February, many times people have an eye on what Blacks have achieved. Um, over the last few decades, 
not only is Black history recognized in the United States of America, but also in other countries from the United Kingdom uh, to Canada, um, Ireland, and many countries in Africa now recognize Black History Month at different times throughout the year. So this week, what I'm going to do, I actually we're going to travel back in time about five years. And this is one of the first major speaking engagements that I had uh, where I gave, I was a keynote address speaker for the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Scholarship Foundation in Florence, Alabama at the University of North Alabama. So I'm going to share uh, many of the portions of this speech with you. Uh, and what I'll talk about in this speech is the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King um, as well as my dream uh, growing up as a young child wanting to become a physician. So stay tuned for this uh, episode. Let me know what you think. Give me feedback. Uh, but here we go. As I stand before you today, I can't help but reflect on the numerous sacrifices that were made to pave the roadway for me to achieve my goals and dreams. It is written in John chapter 4, verse 37 and 38. Thus the same one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. And they could have stopped there because that was good enough, but it gets even better. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Once again, others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Amen. He faced fear 
adversity, and the reality of death on a daily basis. But this did not deter him from completing the God-given calling that was placed on his life. Here are some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s most notable achievements. He helped lead the Montgomery bus cut in 1955. We all know the story of Rosa Parks. This demonstration lasted for a little over a year, and with nearly universal participation from the black community, many of whom had to walk each day to work many miles. As a result, segregation of transportation was ruled unconstitutional. He was one of the co-founders and was elected president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957, an organization that provided leadership for the civil rights movement. In 1963, in Birmingham, Alabama, the focus of the civil rights movement shifted. It became the focus of national attention, gained through the police brutality on black protesters, which helped gain national attention for the struggle for equality. Later in 1963, the March for Jobs and Freedom, better known as the March on Washington, took place. And this became one of the pivotal moments of the Civil Rights Movement. A date that's synonymous with Dr. Martin Luther King is August 28, 1963, when he stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in front of 250,000 people and eloquently recited the I Have a Dream speech. He declared that he had a dream that still had a dream deep Rooted, deeply rooted in the American dream, that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. In 1964, at the young age of 35, Dr. Martin Luther King became the youngest person to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize at that time. The work of Dr. Martin Luther King was very influential and convincing President Lyndon Bain Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Dr. Martin Luther King was also very vocal in speaking out against injustice worldwide, including the unpopular opposition against the Vietnam War. So how Martin Luther King's life impacted others? Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of freedom, justice, and equality was a lifestyle. He talked the talk and he walked the walk. He lived it, in essence. His vision for the civil rights movement was specifically and skillfully tied to the American ideal of genuine freedom, justice, and equality. It involved a faith in the future in which people would be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, and if necessary, to go to jail together, to stand up for these inalienable rights, together knowing that one day we would all be free. Dr. Martin Luther King incorporated the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, the ideals of nonviolent direct action with a Christian doctrine of love to give birth to an effective weapon that people could utilize to combat oppression. It is interesting to me that Dr. Martin Luther King chose to use the word dream when he spoke about his vision for mankind. It is very commonplace that churches and organizations have vision, mission and vision statements which speak about the qualities of purpose. However, Dr. King chose to use the word dream, which was very simplistic, however, yet powerful, powerfully symbolic. It was something that everyone, young and old, could and can still relate to. He was able to unify not only African Americans, but also all Americans, to believe in the American dream that was spelled out by our founding fathers in the United States Constitution and the Direct Declaration of Independence. He referred to these ideals laid out in, the, in this document as a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. He further stated that this note was a promise that all men, as black men and white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He went on to say that America had default on you know, this promissory note as far as citizens of color are concerned. Dr. Martin Luther King refused to believe that there were insufficient funds for the great loss of opportunity in this great nation. 
he lived his life with the hope that even if he didn't see all the work come to fruition, that future generations would make it to the promised land. He was very content with dying for what he believed in. He lived his life without fear of man. Another Another basic tenet of Dr. King's dream was one of hope. He knew that without hope, his movement would die. Hope motivates and inspires, he stated. He also stated that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In a short 13-year period, Dr. Martin Luther King's leadership achieved more genuine progress for racial equality in America than the previous 350 years had produced. His life was abruptly and tragically ended in April, on April 4, 1968, when he was fatally shot in Memphis, Tennessee. However, his dream lives on. And it lives on in each one of us. Reflection I ask, what are we doing in our daily lives to keep Dr. Martin Luther King's dream alive? To the high school students in this audience, my background resembles yours. I am a product of the Alabama public school system. I played high school sports and later in track and football. I participated in tutoring locally with the co-arm tutoring program. I participated in the Mr. in the Battalion competition with, and was named Mr. Gold in 1998. I was mentored by physicians, Dr. Wayne Stanley and Dr. John Young, who saw potential in me long before I knew of it myself. I draw on these similarities to emphasize the point that there is not much difference between you and myself. You have a dream. You sit where I sat 20 years ago. I had a dream. If I can achieve my dreams, so can you. I received my undergraduate and medical degrees from historically black colleges and universities. My experiences in these environments were both humbling and inspirational to me. It was great to be immersed in an environment with many African-American students, as well as students from many African and Caribbean nations, who are all united on a common goal of achieving excellence in their selected fields of study. No longer was I a big fish in a small pond, so to speak. No longer would I be able to be the top of my class by just showing up and doing what everyone else was doing. It required me to make sacrifices, to study long hours, to miss out on parties, to sacrifice sleep, even to miss out on family gatherings and vacations. But I knew without a doubt why I was there. Like Dr. King, I knew that the journey that I was undertaking would impact the lives of many others. During my undergraduate years, I was afforded the opportunities to be able to do medical research at some of the top universities in this country, at Duke University and at Johns Hopkins Universities. During my tenure at Johns Hopkins, I learned of a surgeon by the name of Dr. Levi Watkins. He grew up in Alabama and was a member of Dr. Martin Luther King's church in Montgomery. During his early adulthood, he became deeply ingrained in the civil rights movement. The lessons that his mentor taught him remained dear to his heart throughout his career. He went on to become the first black graduate of Vanderbilt Medical School, as well as the first black cardiac surgery, surgery resident at Johns Hopkins University. In February of 1980, the year of my birth, Dr. Watkins performed the world's first human implantation of the automatic implantable defibrillator. He made many advancements in open heart surgery techniques with the defibrillator and with the defibrillator to save thousands of lives over the years. Equally important, 
Dr. Watkins was instrumental in mentoring and making a way for, up, for others to progress to higher levels of education. During his four-year tenure, tenure on the admissions committee at Johns Hopkins University, he increased the enrollment of African-American students by 400%. During that time, 121 students graduated from medical school, 14 of which were black. And this is still the largest percentage in the school's history today. After graduating from Xavier University, I was accepted into Howard University College of Medicine. During the orientation, we sat in a large auditorium similar to this to receive instruction for the upcoming year. A professor stood before us and bellowed out, look to your left and look to your right. One of you three people will likely not graduate from medical school. Wow. It didn't take long for this to manifest as we lost approximately 20 students in the first semester. But I knew without a doubt it wouldn't be me. I was there on a mission. Hard work was not new to me because I had broken every child labor law working with my father during my life. I'll speak to us coming home at some point in time. But I promised my parents that I would, when I left home that I wasn't coming back because I knew what was home if I did return. My dad always told me that it was either hard work or education. But he forgot to tell me that even with an education, I would still have to work hard. But that was probably the point. Another professor asked us to take out a small note card and write down a message to ourselves. I didn't understand the weight of those nine words, but in time it would become a source of inspiration. I have what it takes to be a physician. What that professor already knew, and I was soon come to learn, is that when times got tough, we need a mantra or a battle cry to hold tight to. I imagine that's what Dr. Martin Luther King did when he would empower people with saying, we shall overcome. Dr. Martin Luther King once stated that we must have slogans during any revolution in order to get people on fire, motivate them, and get them moving. After medical school, I encountered one of the first life-defining moments in my career. I was faced with the reality that a dream that was birthed in me as a teenager was now in jeopardy. I did not get accepted into orthopedic surgery residency. After not gaining acceptance up into orthopedic surgery, I was faced with the reality to choose another career path or to persevere to my goals. Statistics told me that I had less than a 10% chance of obtaining an interview and far less than a 5% chance of gaining acceptance into a residency program. The pool of applicants were full of students that graduated in the top 5% of their classes with standardized test scores in the 99th percentile. Thank God I already knew that I had what it took to be a physician. Right. This gave me the confidence to endure a year of working 80 to 100 hours a week on my job, attending extra lectures and events in the orthopedic department to gain attention on the chairman flying around the country for interviews while at the same time trying to figure out a plan and a strategy for a plan B if this all fell through. But in the words of Dr. Levi Watkins, the finger of God never points you where the hand of God will not deliver you. Now, if I can seem like Reverend Bonner, I would use the words of Travis Green to say, when our backs were against the wall and it looked as if it was over, Lord, you made a way. <laughs> I would soon have many lessons learning that God is faithful and favor and fair. Yeah. So since we're on a college university tonight, I'm gonna to come up with a new mathematical equation called favor. And what favor is, it doesn't matter what percentage, 5%, 10%, 50%, 
when you do, do whatever percentage you're standing with and God in the equation, that equals 100% success. For my children that are understanding and learning how to do simple addition right now, if you have one plus zero, that equals that number. Another number plus one equals the number higher. But no matter what number you have, if you add God into that equation, that equals 100 every time. So in summary, Dr. Martin Luther King's life and time here on Earth was short, but very effective and efficient. He had the uncanny ability to stand alive alongside presidents and dignitaries, but more importantly, to stand and march alongside his people, people in their struggle for equality. As stated before, in only 13 years, he was able to see many bills passed for transportation equality, voters' rights, fair housing, and equal white rights in the workplace. However, he was unable to see the likes of Ms. Katherine Johnson, a NASA physicist who helped calculate the orbit of the Apollo 2 flight to the moon, or Oprah Winfrey, the first African-American female billionaire to revolutionize daytime talk shows and broadcasting, or the election of the first black president of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. As a product of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, I currently serve as the medical director of sports medicine at South Central Regional Medical Center in Laurel, Mississippi. More importantly, this is only two hours away from where my grandmother escaped from freedom over 80 years ago. I performed surgery on patients whose ancestors once owned my ancestors as property. My wife and I have a chance to mentor young black women and black men to usher them into their future and to inspire them to dream larger than their current environment. I worship in a church with a black pastor and a majority white congregation, a multiracial congregation at that, in the free state of Jones County in Laurel, Mississippi. I truly attend St. John's Day School, which is a private school, where in all classes they are the far minority, but they have an equal chance to ascend to the top of the class. I envision that this is the promised land that Dr. Martin Luther King dreamed of, but was unable to reach himself. In closing, I would like to share a quote from Les Brown with my millennials in the crowd. And if you are under the age of 40, please stand. Another definition of millennial is if, if you have acute heart pain, chest pain, and you're about 10 feet from your cell phone, you're probably a millennial. <laughs> so Les Brown is one of the world-renowned, inspirational, and motivational speakers of our time, despite being labeled educable, mentally retarded in elementary school. A quote that he is very famous and known for goes just like this. If you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose your terror for the opposition for it. If you'll simply go after that thing that you want with all the capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence and stern pertinacity, and neither cold, poverty, famine or gout, sickness nor pain of body and brain, and keep you away from that thing that you want. If dogged and grim, you beseech and beset it. With the help of God, you will get it. Dr. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream that helped me keep my dream alive. There's somebody here in the audience today who also has a dream. So let's together keep Dr. Martin Luther King's dream alive. <laughs>
Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Listen.